please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. First scripture reading today is Mark 4, 26 through 32. He also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nest in its shade. Before uh, rendering the second scripture reading, I just wanted to kind of set the context a little bit. Uh, I'm intrigued at how often in the Gospel of Mark it references uh, Jesus being in a boat. And that's because uh, in the early part of Jesus' ministry was done around this region, the Sea of Galilee. And that's the northern part of the Holy Land. And you can see uh, Nazareth, uh, the hometown of Jesus, as he started his ministry, he uh, stayed somewhat close to home. And uh, again, since he was around water, he was around boats a lot. And I think about how when Jesus called his first uh, disciples, they were fishermen and they were in their fishing boat, casting their nets into the sea. Oftentimes you'll hear in the Bible that Jesus was in a boat to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee rather than walking its uh, perimeter. Uh, but I'm intrigued today because it talks about Jesus. He was teaching people from a boat. And the reason he had to do this is because so many people were pressing in upon him. He had to create a distance between him and the people. So Jesus is teaching the people from a boat and he offers to them this parable. Chapter Mark, uh, ch uh, chapter four of the Gospel of Mark, beginning with verse one. Again, he, Jesus, began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the sea and sat there. While the whole crowd was beside the sea, on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell on the path and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And it sprang up quickly since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain growing up and increasing and yielding 30 and 60 and a hundred fold. And he said to them, let anyone with ears to hear listen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. So every year, the farmer goes out in the fields because he wants to grow crops. And he does it through seed. Seed is precious. And I'm thinking if I'm planting seed, I would want to be as careful as possible 
on how and where I would plant it because I want to make the best use of it. I mean, when you, it comes down to it, farming is a business. And like any business, if you want to be productive as possible, you don't want to waste. And for those of us who have planted gardens, we know there's a lot of preparation in the planting of a garden. Those seeds. You till the ground, you dig a little trench, and carefully you plant those seeds into the trench because you want to make the most of what is available. And consider in the days of Jesus how much more precious those seeds were in the growing of crops because there was more of a scarcity of food. Oftentimes, you know, that seed was not just for that year's harvest. They had to be thinking ahead in case there were bad years coming. If there was a shortage, they needed to have a surplus of crops to store. So when the harvests were plentiful, they had to be frugal and to prepare for possibly a poor harvest or no harvest at all. But what makes me wonder, what's going on in the mind of this farmer in the parable of Jesus? Jesus said a sower went out to sow. Nothing unusual about that, that's what farmers do, except that right from the beginning, he's indiscriminately tossing this seed in all kinds of places that don't seem practical at all. You know, rather than placing that seed carefully into the prime soil, we see him scattering it all over. The beginning of the parable states it this way, as he, the farmer, sowed, some seed fell upon the path and the birds came and ate it up. That is, he scattered seed onto a hardened surface where people walked and traveled. And that's what will happen if you try to plant seed on a hardened surface. And my question is, why is the farmer put it, throwing seed in a place like that? I mean, can you imagine if we tried to plant seed out here on Detroit Road or on Route 90? And then it says that he sowed seeds here among the rocks. Some seed fell among the rocky places where they did not have much soil. They sprang up quickly, but when the sun rose, they were scorched since they had no root, and they withered away. Well, yeah. That's what's going to happen if you try to plant seeds among rocks. Then, he said, then the parable says he planted seeds here among the thorns. And the thorns grew up and they choked the plants and they yielded no grain. Common sense tells us that we should only plant seed where the soil is right and fertile where the roots can take hold and grow deep, and so you can have hope for an abundant harvest. What grabs my attention is the fact that this parable is saying something about how we are supposed to spread the gospel. As the church of Jesus Christ, we are the seed throwers for the kingdom of God. We sow the seeds, of the gospel in various places with the hopes that that seed will, will take hold, that the gospel will grow and will flourish and there will be a harvest, as the parable says, of 30 and 60 or 100 fold. That's what our mission dollars are for, that we send out to fund missionary efforts. And if we're gonna spend those mission dollars, we sure want to make sure that we're putting them in the best place possible, except that does not seem to be what the parable is saying. This farmer is scattering seed in all the wrong places. Now, could it be? We're not altogether clear about what good soil is. I'm thinking there are places in the world where the Christian faith is flourishing and has flourished where, frankly, it never should have. You know, I remember when I was in college and I had a political science teacher uh, who talked about his visit to the Soviet Union at, during the time of the Cold War. This was the period when President Reagan called 
the Soviet Union an evil empire. Every indication was that this was rocky soil for the gospel. And yet he talked about how he visited churches in the Soviet Union that were packed with worshipers, despite the fact that organized religion was against the law. And among the worshipers, he noticed there were soldiers in uniform, clapping and praying, some of them with tears streaming down their cheeks. This was the godless land of Russia? Was this the thorn-gorged wasteland of religious faith that we were told it was? And we continue to hear stories of large-scale movements toward the Christian faith in places like Africa. Many of these people in Ethiopia and other poverty-stricken areas walk several miles in bare feet to get to church. Missionaries talk about streams of worshipers plotting their way to church with their Bibles in hand because they are yearning to learn about the Word of God. Most of these church facilities where they worship have no comfortable pews, no electricity. Many of the worshipers have to stand because there's not enough sitting room. And they do this to hear the Word of God. An unlikely place. Or I think about Korea. You know, a long time ago, Presbyterian churches Uh, would send missionaries. And there was some resistance to that because um, in that place, there were so many other world uh, religions that the Korean people, how they worshiped. But now today in Korea, there are churches with 10,000 members or 15,000 members. What looks like rocky soil sometimes turns into fertile soil. I'm thinking, what if the perspective of the missionaries at that time who went to Korea kind of gave up and said, yeah, that's not the right place for us to go. The gospel will never be received. And then we have to look at ourselves in our own country and the opportunities for the freedom of expression for religion. And you would think that this would be prime fertile soil for the gospel. Many of our forebearers who wrote and shaped our nation's constitution were very much influenced by their Christian beliefs and their desire was for our nation to be guided by Christian values and principles. I'm not sure that worked. You know, I recall at my commencement in seminary, in 1985, we had a guest speaker. He was a missionary. His name was Dr. Sam Moffat, and he served in that capacity as a missionary for decades. And he said to us, the graduating class in 1985, he said, I want to tell you about the fastest growing religion in the United States. It's not Islam, it's not Buddhism, and it's not Christianity. The fastest growing religion in the United States is no religion at all. And could it be that because in our country, faith is too easy? It could be that we aren't persecuted enough or hard up enough to appreciate what it means to have faith in the face of adversity. What can appear to be fertile soil turns out to be rocky soil and the places where you think the Christian faith should not grow, does. Notice in the parable it says, there were seeds which fell on rocky soil, that is on the road and and, and among the thorns, and then there was seed which fell on good soil and brought forth good grain, but it doesn't tell us what the good soil was. There are times when something beautiful can sprout in the unlikely places. And so we need to quit being preoccupied with determining the kind of soil is worthy of the gospel and to get out there throwing the seeds. That's the art of seed throwing. Our mission as the Rocky River Presbyterian Church is not to determine whether the gospel will grow 
in the community we serve, it's not to sit down and calculate where the good news will flourish, it's to get out there and start throwing the seeds amidst the rocks and the highways and the thorns and allow God to determine how it will take hold. I mean, this is the kind of determination you see in the early church. The parting words of of Jesus were this, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lo, I am with you always, he says. And that's all the disciples needed to know. And after the resurrection of Jesus and after his departure, we see them planting those seeds, first in Jerusalem and then in surrounding cities and other regions of the Holy Land, and finally across the waters of the Mediterranean. The Apostle Paul went on his missionary journeys to bring the good news to places he'd never seen before himself, to foreigners and to pagans, to the Gentiles. These were people that the Jews said, hey, the gospel is not for them. Yes, it is. And like what the parable said, those seeds brought forth grain yielding 30, 60, and 100-fold. So there are three things. I think people should know about the art of seed throwing. And the first is this. God's seed throwers are abundant with their seed throwing because they worship, the God they worship is abundant. And they know that God did not hold back his love from us, that God, through his son, showers us with abundant grace and mercy. And if we worship a God of abundance, then we need to be abundant and extravagant with our seed throwing. Throw it out there and see what happens. The other thing God's seed throwers know is that when you sow gospel seeds, you often don't see the results. And sometimes those those gospel seeds, they lie deep and they lie dormant. Only later do they begin to grow. And maybe that's something for us to consider, that the things that you say and that you do in the presence of other people may be what will change that person, if not now, somewhere, sometime, later in their lives. Think back over your life on the people who influenced you the most, who made their mark upon you. Chances are, oftentimes, you weren't even aware of the influence that they made on your life. And only by looking back, only by reflecting on those seeds being given to them are they able to see how they took hold. You may not always see the results when you plant a seed, but that doesn't mean they won't eventually grow. And the third thing is about God's seed throwers is to know that God is the one who determines the harvest. God, through the working of his Holy Spirit, is the one who causes that seed to grow. And God is the one who produces good fruit from it. If the one in the parable the one of the follow line, on lines of that parable, Jesus says this, the kingdom of God is as if somebody would scatter seed upon the ground and would sleep night and day and the seed would sprout and grow and he does not know how. The seed is a mystery. How does seed sprout? God is the one who determines that. There's something very freeing about knowing that God is the great harvester and the grower of the seed and that we can put our confidence in him for that. So the farmer went out to sow. Some seed fell among the rocks, some fell on the road, and some seed fell among the thorns. Turns out this farmer had the right idea. Amen.